Okay, back to talk about the subphylum vertebrata, the vertebrates. So a vertebrate is a chordate that has a backbone. And this backbone, we usually think of as being made of bone, but it also could be made of cartilage. That counts as well. Um, so let's take a look at this. Um, so, oh, before we get into the phylogeny, a couple other things. Um, the vertebrates also have an anterior, um, I should say skull, not brain, <laughs> an interior skull of cartilage or bone encasing the brain. In some cases, um, the skull is not complete, it's just a partial skull when we're at some of our more basal uh, vertebrates, but they should have something. <laughs> Some other shared derived characters we see in the vertebrates um, are the presence in, uh, of Hox or other developmental gene duplication. So again, Hox genes are those genes that um, control development. We also see complex nervous and skeletal systems and well-developed circulatory systems and well-developed muscular systems um, that can um, you know, be serviced by this complex um, circulatory system. Now, the combination of having these well-developed circulatory and muscular systems and well-developed nervous systems, um, this all lends itself very well to allowing these organisms to become large and be very active predators, which led to a very wide diversification. So we're going to follow um, this above phylogeny with a few changes. Um, we are going to change the name bony vertebrate to osteoichthians. So um, we're going to change that name here. So that's going to be known as the osteoichthians. And we want to add a clade here that we're going to call the tetrapods. So that's just kind of a, a little bit different than we're going to go from what your book shows us. Okay, so we're going to talk first about the most basal of our vertebrate group known as the hagfishes class meninxi. Now, these are called the invertebrate vertebrates um, because these guys, um, they do have a skull of cartilage. Uh, they lack jaws, and they actually lack vertebrae. They do have very, very rudimentary vertebrate-type things, but they're not what you would really call vertebrae. So they um, are kind of like the invertebrate vertebrate, in a, in a sense, but they are still included in this, this clade you see here. So let's take a look at these guys. So... They've got a very small brain, uh, very sort of small rudimentary eyes, ears, and nasal openings. Most of their, uh, mostly they use their sensory tentacles here that they have around their mouth. And they are marine bottom feeders that eat things like worms or sick dead fish or other small, very disgusting sounding things. They have these glands running all down their body that are called slime glands. And you can see where they're called slime glands. So um, they don't have much in the way of defense, right? They, they kind of look like they wouldn't win many fights. But they have this really cool adaptation that when um, there is a predator near and if they're scared, they produce this slime to sort of confuse the predator uh, and they can produce, I'm not kidding, several liters per minute. So it's really, uh, it's really impressive the amount of slime that they can produce in an incredibly short period of time. I wouldn't mess with them, that's for sure. Okay, so let's look at the Petromyzontida, the lampreys. I'm going to bounce back up here for a second. So here's our lampreys. <coughs> so... These guys are also pretty simple as vertebrates go. They're found in marine and freshwater environments. They do not have jaws either. 
Um, although they do have vertebrae, they're pretty simple vertebrae. <clears throat> So the skeleton of this organism is made of cartilage, and the vertebrae are really just kind of these um, cartilaginous projections that only parcel, partially enclose the nerve cord. So it's a pretty rudimentary vertebrae, but it's considered to fit the bill. <coughs> so these guys don't have jaws, but they have this um, very terrifying round mouth. And most of them are parasites that will clamp this round mouth onto their host, oftentimes a fish, um, and they use their tongue, which um, has usually some kind of rasping, sharp projections to bore a hole into the side so it can suck and ingest blood as a food uh, for them. So um, kind of nasty, kind of nasty little guys, uh, but still just trying to make their way in the world, I suppose. So Petromyzontida, um, the lampreys, about 35 species of these guys. <clears throat> and then this brings us to da 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 -nantha stones. So these, let me back up a second. So, oh, this is a mess. Let me, um, let me get my eraser and get rid of some of this hot mess here. Okay, so now we're talking about the nanthostomes. And so in this whole clade, <clears throat> nanthostomes means jaw mouth. So in this whole clade, we're talking about things that have jaws. Other things we see in this clade are the presence of teeth and the presence of paired fins uh, where applicable. So, jaws. Donna, Donna, Donna. Likely evolved from bony supports of interior pharyngeal gill slits. So um, they uh, organisms that had these pharyngeal gill slits oftentimes had things called gill arches made of cartilage that helped support the gills. And the idea is that some of the ones at the anterior end. Uh, became modified to form jaws, which probably at first had no teeth, uh, but eventually developed teeth. And the combination of jaws and teeth, um, or other kind of sharp structure, enabled these nanthostomes to grip food firmly and slice it into pieces. So this was a massive uh, advantage in terms of getting lots of calories at once. And one thing that happens when you have jaws and teeth is you don't really need um, these gill slits for filter feeding anymore, right? You don't need to suspension feed if you can take a big bite out of something. So additional gill arches probably helped support heavier, more efficient jaws, which in turn could uh, support teeth. Um, so that's the idea of how jaws uh, came along. Other things we see in some of the groups we're about to talk about include paired fins, right? So we didn't see this in the hagfish or the lampreys, but we are going to see it in some of the organisms we're going to look at coming up. So by paired, I mean um, they're paired, right? They're, there's one on this side and then there'd be one on the other side. We also see something called the lateral line system appearing, and this is for vibration sensing. So if you do any kind of, if you've seen fish much, um, you can see uh, down the body of the fish, uh, sometimes even visibly, there are these little uh, structures in a line, that's called the lateral line system, and it is for uh, vibrational sensing. So we're gonna look at three big groups let me go back here. Within uh, the nanthostomes, we're going to look at the chondrichthians. So these are organisms that have a uh, skeleton made of cartilage. And then we're going to look, and my pen doesn't want to work at all. We're going to look at a group called the ray finned fishes. And we're also going to look at a group called the lobed fin fishes, which would include both the celianths and the lung fishes. So we're going to look at those uh, three groups right there, starting with the uh, class uh, chondrichthys. <clears throat> All right, so let's look a little bit about this class uh, chondrichthys. So this includes the sharks, 
the rays and the skates. Um, also, the uh, chimeras, which are also known as ratfish. Mm-hmm. So, these guys, one thing they have in common, and what the name chondrichthys is in reference to, is that their skeleton is made of cartilage. Now, there are sometimes some parts that have been hardened with calcium, for example, the teeth. And um, their bodies are actually covered with modified teeth in some species. Um, we call these dermal denticles, or sometimes they get referred to as placoid scales. And we'll have some of these specimens in lab, and um, you'll have to be careful when you do this, but you can, um, with a gloved hand, kind of feel that, wow, you know, if you go sort of the wrong way, like these are sharp, um, these dermal denticles are quite sharp. Um, Be careful when you do that. (laughs) Um, These organisms must constantly swim to keep the flow of water over their gills and to not sink. Um, And one reason for that is they are more dense than water. So if they weren't constantly moving around, they would sink. Most of them are carnivorous, and I think most of us associate sharks with being carnivores. Uh, But the largest of sharks are actually uh, suspension feeders. Sharks have numerous rows of teeth uh, and acute senses for prey pursuit. They lack ears and rather will sense vibrations through their body and send it to inner ear bones so they can hear it in that way. So there are three groups within the chondrichthys. The sharks uh, are the largest and the most diverse. The rays and skates, um, so like this, these are flattened uh, bottom feeders that will crush mollusks that they find on the sea floor. And the ratfish, also known as the chimeras, are usually found uh, quite deep in the ocean And some of them are venomous with um, modified um, dorsal fins that contain toxins. Um, So yeah, a really kind of cool, interesting group. So the next group we're gonna talk about are, let me get my eraser. the ray finned fishes well actually really as as a group we're going to be kind of switching to going from um you know things with skeletons made of cartilage to things with um skeletons that have been ossified that are bony so we're entering this clade we call osteichthyes which means that we have a hard bone So this is going to include several groups. The ones we're going to focus on right now are the groups of fishes, the ray-finned fishes and the lobed-finned fishes. Oh, here we go. That's where I want it to be. So yes, osteichthyes. Here we go. All right, the osteichthyes. Um, So clade osteichthyes can include ray-finned fishes and bone-finned fishes. I'm sorry, and lobe fin fishes uh, that have an ossified or bony endoskeleton hardened with calcium phosphate. Now, uh, this clade also includes tetrapods, but typically when we say osteichthyes, we're usually talking about fish. Um, we're going to start by just talking about fish, then we'll move on to the tetrapods. So the osteichthyes split into two major groups, the ray fin fishes and the lobed fin fishes. Um, in the early lineages of the Osteichthians, um, so the early ones, they developed these gas-filled sacs um, that allowed them to supplement um, gill breathing by doing gas exchange with the atmosphere. So really a lung-like structure. Now, in what we call the ray-finned fishes, these lung-like structures um, developed into swim bladders and in our lobed finned fishes um, they developed into a lung. Um, So I'm going to go over a few terms um, of anatomy we need to know that are going to come up now. um, This is a ray finned fish (laughs) that we are seeing right here but some of these structures we find in both. So um, it's kind of cut away but we have an operculum. 
usually, which is a bony structure that will cover the gills, which we have here. Um, the ray finned fishes are going to control buoyancy by this swim bladder, which was derived from the lung like structure in the early osteichthyans. In the lobed finned fishes, this is actually going to continue to function like a lung. We also have um, the body covered with scales, and these scales additionally have mucus on them to help make them uh, more hydro, um, not hydrophilic, but hydro, uh, hydronomic, uh, air, hydrodynamic, there we go, that's the word I'm looking for, more hydrodynamic. And they also possess this lateral line system where they can sense vibrations. Okay, so let's talk ray finned fishes, class Actopterygii. Um, so these are probably what you envision if I say fish. They are the most commonly known fishes. Um, they are found in every marine environment. Um, they probably have the greatest variety of any vertebrate. So they get their name because they have little bony rays that support their fins. So that's why they are called the ray finned fishes. And probably this is most apparent right here in this fin. So most of these breed in nutrient rich shallow waters um, and they are really important sources of protein to humanity. They have what's called single circulation which means that the heart pumps blood to the gills where they will pick up oxygen and uh, get rid of CO2. And then that blood from that same pump is going to make its way to the rest of the body to drop off that oxygen and pick up CO2 and then returns to the heart where it gets pumped again and goes to the gills. So this, it all goes on one, one circuit. Um, so that's called single circulation. And um, it's not the world's most efficient compared to some of the things that have evolved uh, in some of the groups, um, like the tetrapods. We're going to see um, variations on this that will be more efficient uh, than this single circulation. But this is what we see in this group. OK, we're back. And we're going to talk about the Sartopterygii, the lobe finned fishes. So rather than the um, you know, sort of a, the way they get their name um, is because they have these rod shaped bones surrounded by muscle in their pectoral and pelvic fins. Um, so you can kind of appreciate that a little bit here and here uh, and certainly here, although this is uh, a transition it, Terry, uh, transitionatory uh, organism we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so uh, in these organisms, in the lobe finned fishes, <clears throat> the lung like sacs did not evolve into swim bladders. Instead, they continued to work to allow oxygen exchange with the air and eventually led to true lungs. Um, and there are three surviving lineages of lobe fins. Um, we have um, the Actesina, also known as the Celiants. So this is a group uh, that was thought to be completely extinct. Um, for like thousands of years until in 1938 some fishermen uh, I believe off the coast of India found one and then uh, some others have been found after that so that's a pretty um, you don't we don't often get many wins so that was kind of cool um, another important group known as Dipnoa these are the lung fishes that we find in stagnant ponds and swamps and um, what they'll do is they'll come up and gulp air into lungs connected to their pharynx. They also have gills, so they also breathe through gills, but um, again, being in a stagnant, stagnant water, the dissolved oxygen is not uh, particularly good. So the other group is the tetrapods, which is a group that is getting closer to the group that we are in. Um, these are uh, organisms that adapted to life on land and gave rise to limbed vertebrates. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. 
So let's talk a little bit about tetrapod evolution. And in particular, we're going to look at this organism known as tiktaalik. So it's thought that these lobe fins came out of the water and evolved to life on land sometime in the late Devonian period, which is in the Paleozoic era about 350 to 400 million years ago. So these lobed fin fishes used fleshy bony fins to support themselves on the muddy bottom where swimming was probably different and they probably held their head above water for uh, breathing in air. And what's really remarkable, and let's get a little closer look, about this organism called Tiktaalik, this fossil um, is really a very excellent example of a transition between fish life and uh, tetrapod, uh, you know, terrestrial land life. It's got many early tetrapod characters. Um, it's got lungs, it's got bony limbs with a similar skeletal pattern to other tetrapods, which we can see here, right? We've got, the, we've got the humerus, we've got the ulna, we've got wrist bones, we've got the radius. This is the fin skeleton, by the way. Um, this organism likely couldn't walk really well on land, but it could prop itself up in water using its fins. And this discovery was really critical in helping paleontologists reconstruct the progression of fin to limb development uh, in the fossil record. So this organism would have had um, uh, lungs for breathing. It also would have had gills for breathing, dissolved, uh, dissolved oxygen in the water. It had a neck right, which fish did not have. It did have neck bones allowing it to move the head. It had ribs, it had fin skeleton, it had a flat skull with eyes on top, which is much more of a tetrapod feature uh, than a fish feature. So it was really like a half and half organism. Um, so really uh, quite amazing. And if we look at some of these fossil lobe fins, we see a clear progression from fins used for aquatic locomotion towards more jointed limbs used for terrestrial locomotion. Um, so if we look at some of these earlier fossil lobed fins, and here's Tiktaalik, and then here's a more uh, sort of semi-terrestrial organism, we can see these ray bones slowly starting to become the distal elements of the fin, uh, wrist, or hand. Um, and it's thought that, uh, well, it's not thought, the fossil rep record shows that these organisms actually started with eight digits uh, based on the number of those ray bones that they had. And um, the five digits we have are actually a derived trait that happened later on. All right, we're going to take a break here and come back in the next video and talk about the tetrapods.